and to do it alone is a hugely challenging job. So with that said, I admire his, his commitment um, to a task of, uh, I don't know a lot. We are just getting to know some of the offerings that he has. We, we are just getting to know that aspect of it. But I absolutely commend him to be able to go on into the horizon uh, to know more and then help others to use that. So that really is my scoop of the moment. And I, I'm very privileged that he's here. Uh, he's a very busy commission. So um, he was asking who is here. Some of us are staff, some of us are people who are interested in this topic. Whoever is meant to be here is here. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Are we set up? Yeah. <laughs> I want to get you up or whatever you like to do. Uh, this circle format is very comfortable for you, but I uh, completely foreign to me. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to excuse me if I get up and move about the room because I actually think I'm, I'm the one that's being uh, dissected here unless I do that to <laughs> distinguish myself from somebody that's a little different. The cliff that the doctor talks about, that he claims he was pushed off of, I literally jumped off of myself a number of years ago. I leaped off of that cliff. And uh, I remember saying during that, that evening that we were together having that meal that um, once you do that, once you leap, once you go over that cliff, whether you were pushed, as he claims he was, or whether you just take a good leap on your own, then you are free. And you can embrace some of the craziest things that you never thought you would embrace and be so open-minded as to look at each particular tool that's brought to you in the context of how it may help, as opposed to... And so we've now learned, I'm sure you've evolved to this point, where that's, that's not our approach anymore. We're always looking for the, the, the edge, the difference. And we really don't care. I don't care about research. I, I, interestingly enough, uh, Melissa and I were giving a talk a couple of weeks ago. And I don't know if you were aware of it, but uh, when we gave that talk, there was a gentleman in the room. And um, the very talk that I gave, I'm going to be giving to you today. Um, and it's a message about how to correct visual problems. Very serious one. And this gentleman, and I didn't perceive somebody as angry at getting up, but a little gal that works for me said, oh, that this doctor, he said, he had to be a doctor. This doctor came out, and he was beside himself, wondering, what the heck this guy, meaning me, was talking about. He has no scientific evidence to back him up. There have been no studies, and this is a bunch of baloney, this guy's hashing out in front of this crowd. And he had to leave because of the disgust and disdain he had for me. And I sort of laugh at things like that because I don't care about that research. Um, I was, I wanted see what works. And just about everything that I do had to be documented and will be documented as anecdote because I'm probably never going to be in a research program that allows for that gobbledygook of uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled, crossover. These are words that mean nothing to me. But others do the research. I don't have the time or the inclination to worry about it. And one of the areas that uh, might as well be my trump card with you today is to allow you to become my emissary for a unique program that we offer. I think it gives you an insight as to the various things that are possible. And in this area and arena of visual loss, uh, those who are afflicted, and there are many people who are suffering these vision losses today, you, they're in your family. I mean, it may be you, actually, but if it's not you, you are not untouched by this. 
you have the father or the grandparent who's losing their vision and losing it rapidly. And what I need to tell you today is that we have a battle cry. And we restore that lost vision. And we do it now. And I need to get the message across to you on how, in fact, that can be done. Because in the conventional world, this does not exist. And though the doctor who left my talk of a couple weeks ago probably left due to the embarrassment of not having anything to offer people who are consulting them, who are having these visual disturbances and losing their sight. And they're going blind. And there's not one thing he can do about it. To hear from an anesthesiologist, which is what my training is, that there, in fact, is plenty to do about it, and that we can get this thing turned around very rapidly, is the positive message that everybody in the audience enjoyed, but it rubbed that guy, guy the wrong way. What a different clinician he and I really are. Because if somebody had a message that said that they could do something that no one else could do, I would be captivated. I wouldn't leave my chair. I would, I'd have to ask as many questions as I could. I'd probably end up having to take the guy out for dinner afterwards to just hound him to death to learn as much as I could about what it is that he's offered. So now there's the difference. You can storm out of a meeting and say, that's got to be a bunch of lies. Or you can get right and immersed in the whole thing, which I hope we're able to do. And now I'm going to stand up. <laughs> so and are you going to be able to change the slides that I need to be changed? All right. Let me set a scene here for you. Um, yes, I've been in the alternative realm doing things differently for a number of years. This all got started in the mid-1990s when, at the time, um, doing my daily anesthesia work in the operating rooms of various hospitals throughout the city, um, people came to me to talk about things that I said I'd never heard of before. Um, they were having things done to them and for them that I didn't think could be done. And when I said, look, I've never heard of such a thing, and their answer to me was, well, look, you're a medical doctor. You're going to be the last to know. It didn't sit with me too well. I mean, how as a medical person I'd be the last to know um, was something that was rather challenging. Well, Things evolved. Turns out the things that they were doing um, actually were written about by other doctors, and I could uh, cash in on learning these skills. And that ultimately brought me out of the operating room completely into this intriguing realm of the alternative that I've had to grow in since that time. There is no school that you can go to to learn what I've had to acquire over these years. At best, and it certainly happened that way for me, you're lucky enough to be mentored by somebody who has been very seasoned in these alternative approaches over the years and is willing to take you through their wings to teach you what they are. So years have gone by now. I've had the opportunity to be mentored by many. And now I'm in a position where I do the mentoring. And so it's, it's expected of me to pass on these skills to other doctors because there still is no school to go to to learn them. And um, it's a slow process that occurs over time. One of the most recent additions to my armamentarium happens to be with the issue of vision loss. There are diseases, essentially four, but primarily three diseases that plague us, and every one of us in here as we age will more or less confront all these, um, but that in the conventional world have absolutely, in three of the cases, no treatment at all. They are, and they'll come up many times, number one, something called macular degeneration, the number one, the number two, and unfortunately the most severe of all of them, glaucoma, Number three, diabetic retinopathy. And this fourth one, although um, there's something can be done about it, uh, the numbers of afflicted are so many that those who have cataracts, cataracts are pretty common 
There actually is a surgical approach to try to correct these cataracts. Nonetheless, um, surgery needs to be put last. And in the conventional world, that is the only card they have to play. I say there's plenty to do to avoid the surgery that might very well have a good result. But I've met the people that don't get the good result. I've met that 5 to 7% that uh, through the day that surgery ever was brought to their attention because their vision has nothing been more than a joke. As an anesthesiologist, obviously, this is not my training level. And so much of what I talk about today happens to be uh, the brainchild of an ophthalmologist, Pittsburgh boy, born and raised. Um, had a large practice in an area of a town called Mount Lebanon for years. His name is Dr. Edward Condra. He is the fellow, the ophthalmologist, who put this program together. And um, when he did that, he took it across the country, came to Pittsburgh two or three times a year, and offered this three-day <coughs> treatment program. And I have been for three days that is able to get this vision loss turned around and improve in three days. I think that probably is the first thing that made the doctor get up from the audience and start to storm out the door. Because there he is sitting with no tools as an eye doctor, and they have some anesthesia guy up there talking about how you can reverse that entire process and get it moved in the right direction in three days. So uh, these 10 eye essentials, which very important to that, allow this battle cry to be screened from the rooftops. You can and you should restore your lost vision now. And why let's move to the next slide. Um, our group, my group, and really for them too, like this is only something that I've been able to offer since July of 2013. Dr. Condra's been out there doing this for a lot of years. But he pulled into, and you'll see why in a moment, he pulled into his, his new Ponderosa set up in Dade City, Florida. And he no longer treats anywhere other than Dade City, Florida. The gentleman works three days a month and treats five patients in those three days. And that's all he does. That's the only work he does all month. What he has done is trained other physicians, a handful of us throughout the country, that he allows regionally to do these same programs that he is actively involved with, intimately involved with every single patient that comes to us. Um, so that we can use the program locally and allow more people to become involved. Uh, so, um, next slide, please. Enough about that. Go ahead. Next slide. We'll move through. We'll really... There they are, folks. There's the big four. Three of them, absolutely nothing in the conventional world that can be done at all. I mean, we have these intelligent doctors that say, look, uh, you have macular degeneration. And then you're expecting as the patient that the doctor is going to say, well, this is how we're going to treat it. And to hear, and you are going to hear, that there's absolutely nothing that I can do about this. I'll be happy to monitor you and watch you literally slide either quickly or rapidly down the hillside where your vision is going to be lost, and whatever's lost, you lost it, and there's no way to get it back. What a message that must be. What a hit in the gut that must be. But that is what it is. And the issue of cataracts, I say, is a special, special condition. OK, next slide, please, where you actually can do something about it. This is the, the big one in terms of numbers. And that would lead to blindness, which is irreversible. Uh, Age-related macular degeneration comes in two forms, a wet form and a dry form. Uh, the wet form is nothing more than actually bleeding at the retina, for which they can use injections of, um, of, of materials that will prevent the blood from flowing and cause clotting, but it doesn't do anything to restore the vision. Um, in the case of macular degeneration, you lose the central 
while you maintain the peripheral. So it's not unlikely to find somebody with macular who talks to you like this. Because they can only see you this way. They can't see you straight on. Uh, they will also have a heck of a time navigating after dark. Uh, they, you'll find that they just don't, they, do, they do, don't go out anymore after dark. The daytime is their best chance of uh, navigating around the planet. And uh, nothing can be done. There, there, there's that, that, that quote that conventional medicine has to tell these patients, nothing can be done. Next slide, please. Uh, cataracts are the special category. There's something that can be done. It's just we want to put surgery last, and there's a way to dissolve these cataracts so as to forestall or maybe completely obfuscate the need for that surgery. We'll talk to you about what that may be, too. Next slide, please. Um, terrible one here because in the diabetics, and you're all, you're all seeing it. Seeing the diabetic. The diabetic has this carbohydrate derangement, but the pathological focus of that derangement happens at blood vessels, happens at the microscopic vasculature. And it goes wrong. And you just name the place, and all zip codes are up for grabs when you're a diabetic. If it's your kidney blood vessels that get stars from the blood supply, you go. They're the first to go on dialysis. They're the first to have kidney disease. The first to get the blood pressure problems. The first to have the heart attacks. They're the first to get the Alzheimer's. They're the, because all the blood vessels lose the perfusion and the retina, which is a collection of microscopic vasculature, is ripe for that particular assault also. So diabetics are the ones that go blind the earliest. I mean, I've, I've found many diabetics in their teens and early 20s who lose their vision because of this accelerated process. Nothing can be done. There's the battle for Nothing can be done. Terrible thing that you have to hear if you're the one who's afflicted. Next slide, please. This glaucoma, this is the one that leads to complete and total irreversible blindness. It sneaks up on the afflicted to this extent. Here, they maintain the central while they lose the peripheral. So what happens is the world closes in on them, and they just don't know it. They don't notice it. And so they keep losing out here, and out here, and out here, until one day, they're in here. And they're only here. And this is gone, and the rest of it's going to go. Is that pressure, which is the pathological basis for why this happened, that the intraocular pressures don't get managed effectively. And, um, you know, I know people that don't see eye doctors for 10 and 20 years of click. Uh, others see them frequently, and they always check the pressure. But this is one <coughs> terrible and tragic that nothing can be done. It's also the medical right here. Okay, next slide, please. These are the rarer ones. Every single one of these leads to blindness in their own way. Every single one of these is a retinal. There's the issue, retinal. If it's retinal, as opposed to the lens, which that's a cataract, or if it's opposed to the cornea, which is due to be assisted by a refraction, but if it's retinal, that's pretty much tantamount to not having any conventional medical intervention at all that's happening back there. But these are other issues that uh, can come up and are uh, much more rare, but still, everything we can reverse these conditions just like we reverse the other ones. And in every single case, nothing can be done, is what you're going to hear from your ophthalmologist. Next slide, please. This three-day treatment program, which was devised by Dr. Condra, has an amazing statistic. It just makes me feel bubbly all over to be able to tell people that in three days, 85% of those who are involved with this kind of a treatment program, a treatment program in which there are no drugs, 
I don't use drugs. I came to an anesthesiologist that has a tool chest that's six this high with nothing but every drawer filled with them. That's a pretty odd statement to make. I don't use drugs in any of the patients that I do. Um, no injections and no surgery. Completely non-toxic therapies, and in three days, 85% of those who attend will improve their vision before they return home. You see frightened people enter on the first day. They're scared to death because they've literally seen what's coming up ahead for them, and they're it is frightened. And then they leave three days later with big smiles on their faces because they know they've made the turn. They're not ready to be a fighter pilot just yet, but they have made the turn, and they know that their vision is going to do nothing but improve from that day forward. What a great thing to be able to see in a group of people that didn't really feel that way on the first day they came in. Next slide, please. So Dr. Condra uh, has written three books. The book I've given you is the copy of his latest book. It's called The Ten Eye Essentials to Restore Your Sight. And uh, it's probably the, the best of the three he's written. It is the highway to travel. If you are afflicted with eye diseases and you want to be able to turn this around, there are ten things that need to be done. Seven of them you can do on your own. And I'll quickly go through them so you can see. They're, they're, they're really some common sense things that you need to put into play for yourself. There are a couple things you can't do on your own. And you're going to need some help. And there's going to be a heavy amount of that going on in the three days that we do this treatment program. But it's when you bring all ten of these things to bear and aggressively approach all ten, that you can expect that 85% of the time people's visions are going to be restored in, in some pretty amazing and drastic ways in such a short period of time. So we're going to find out about these 10 essentials. And uh, not to spend much time, you've got the book in front of you. You can take it home. It's now in your library. Um, I'm explaining this to you today so that if you're not afflicted yourself, the person in your family or the next door neighbor, whoever it is that is, they need to hear your message because they are they are, they are frightening themselves and they are getting the one message from their very nice conventional doctor, but unfortunately he is constrained by his tools, and in this case there are no tools to help these people out. So, next slide please. This is why Dr. Kondrat doesn't go any place anymore, okay? <laughs> this is Dr. Kondrat's hangout in Daly City, Florida. Um, <laughs> it, it, he will treat you. But, um, uh, he brings you to this facility from the airport in Tampa, and you're there for the three days. It's uh, the, the right side of that place, and the top floor is an office. The middle part are his living quarters, and then there's a Part that you can't see is where the, the patients literally stay for those three days. Um, but it's a very nice backdrop. Next slide, please. Um, he, this is Dr. Condra. He, he's like a farmer now. He's okay, this very educated man. Loves to like raise livestock and, and, and organic farming. And uh, this is what he spends his time with, except for those three days a month that he actually works. <laughs> yeah, plenty to do there on the farm. Next slide, please. Excuse me. Um, oh, this is just a uh, picture of he and his wife. When he was here in July, passing the baton to me, the very next day he and his wife got downtown at the point, and they got their little bicycles, and they had ridden their bike 335 miles to Washington, D.C. Um, to develop awareness for back there generation. It was all to raise money for macular D. Next slide, please. Next slide. They arrived. Next slide. 
this is a testimonial letter, one of many that Dr. Kondrat gets. I will say two websites you want to be familiar with. Um, one is our website called PittsburghEyeProtocol.com. It's a very easy site to navigate through. It's not very busy, but the story gets told. Then there's Dr. Kondrat's website, which is called HealingTheEye.com. It is a very busy site, just loaded, just loaded with information, and you can get lost. Okay, But if you're looking for information, about these programs, these two sites are the place for you to go and the place to send whoever it may be that you come into contact with that might find be seeking out this kind of help. And this is just somebody who came uh, to his care from Africa, South Africa. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, this is now a nationally known program. Uh, Charlie Sheen has a father who actually is sane. And um, his name is Martin Sheen. And um, everybody knows Martin. And uh, evidently he does a program. I'm not familiar with the program. There's a nationwide program called In Focus. They actually visited Dade City, Florida operation, and they put it out over the entire United States through uh, this particular program. And so this is now out and about. Next slide, please. Uh, this is more of the uh, Dr. Condra I Love Me section, so let's move on. Go ahead. Next slide, please. He is the president of Akima, which is the mm -hmm. Arizona. Next one. Can get the next one? Um, the Arizona. Homeopathic and integrated. He has a distinction, by the way, to mention it. Uh, next slide. Is that he's the world, the world's only homeopathic ophthalmologist. Now that's almost a contradiction of terms, but nonetheless, he certainly is, and we use homeopathy as one of the one of the modalities uh, in, in this uh, three-day program and beyond. So, have you been told, this is now to be said to the, the afflicted one, that nothing can be done to improve your vision? That's all they've been told. Once you lose it, you've lost it, you're not going to get it back. The question is going to be how quickly or slowly you're going to slide down that hill. But there's a hillside there and you're going down. You're supposed to just live with that poor vision? Oh, this thing about driver's license? Oh, you talk about an issue that looms over the afflicted individual. The loss of that driver's license means so much. And uh, the theory is that the driver's license will be taken away. And their independence and their freedom goes with that license. And so invariably, they hang on to the license well beyond when they should have hung on to it. They're not sick. And they're out there on the roads trying as best they can to navigate with this impaired vision, and they're just hanging on to that last vestige of their independence. How nice it is to be able to restore their vision to get that license and not have it in question but losing it anymore. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next. Next. Um, it's a little bit of the, the Dr. Kondrat conversion. He did practice in uh, convention, strictly conventional. He was, the, I think, he was the first to do radial keratotomy back in the day, when that was the only corneal procedure that could be done for uh, uh, nearsightedness. So and he was the first to bring LASIK lasers. But when he moved to 15 years ago, he moved to Arizona. It all changed. That was then he began to work on an alternative program, and he made the big change. And homeopathy cured him and his asthma, and is so often the case with most alternative doctors. Their epiphany usually happened because of some personal crisis. And then they learned that the medicine that they devoted their time to wasn't helpful to them at all. And when they got help, it was usually in some area well outside the boundary of conventional medicine, and that's 
That's when they start taking a different walk. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And again. Okay, so here we go. There are 10 I essentials. You have the book in your hand. I'm going to quickly go through the 10 highlighting uh, some important points about each one of them, not spending much time on any of them, because after all, you've got the book and the reference is a take on it. Diet, nutrition. How can you not go there when it comes to an affliction of the aging? Look. Your deficiencies, which you have really acquired very well up to this point in your life, and you're going to add to them the unfortunate but understandable result is you won't get to leave here. You know when I, when I say leave, what I mean by leaving? Okay, when you leave, without paying the price for those deficiencies. Days. So things like macular degeneration and glaucoma and the like are due to deficiencies of your lifetime. Somebody who's 20 years old doesn't get glaucoma. You get glaucoma when you're 60 or 70 years old because a deficiency is so overplayed and continually played that your body can't do any more work on it and you're whatever the zip code is, is not going to function because of that deficiency state. So we've got to correct deficiencies, the nutrition and the supplementation that goes along with this correction. Thank you. I'm going to thank Melissa for taking charge of this one when we were up in front of the group uh, at the Lawrence Convention Center. But it only makes sense that that diet should be uh, organic. Uh, the issue of being raw is also in this what he means by his 70 or 30 diet, 70 percent of your diet should be organic, raw, or living, because with heat comes proteins that are denatured, and you've lost the, the nutritional content of whatever it is you're cooking. Uh, next slide, please. Even if you eat organic, you got a problem. The problem is it's 2013. There are no more nutrients in the soil. They're not there. A little study um, to prove that takes um, from the 1950s, I think, uh, how much iron was found in um, certain amounts of spinach. 158 milligrams of that era to 2.2 milligrams of today says you can eat the good-looking, organically grown substance, but you can't get the nutrients that you require from it because they're just not in the soil anymore. What this means, therefore, is you're going to have to supplement. Supplements are going to be required because without them, you can eat a very healthy diet, but you can't get the nutrition that you need. Next slide, please. Next. I don't want to say much about GMO, right? I don't know that that's... Uh, and and, and the, the name of the items that are being genetically modified is increasing every day. It all started with the Monsanto company back in the early 1990s. Um, they started with corn, but the, and so that makes corn very difficult to find it. It would be even healthy to eat because it's too <coughs> modified. The DNA has been messed with. And when they mess with the DNA with the corn, what did they do? They mess with the nucleus and the DNA so as to be able to have corn grow that could withstand greater amounts of pesticides. So they literally could, like with a hose, just spray down the cornfields and there'd be no bugs that could mess with their product. I sort of have to laugh today because I go to a giant eagle, there's the corn, and then there's this little paper bag, and I see people shut you dinner, they get shut in the corn, looking for the worm, 
There's no worm. <laughs> Dead worm. Okay, there is no worm. Because the pesticides that they can spray this corn with are so high in their content, there's no worm can survive. I have to laugh when I lead to, oh, well, we're looking for the worm. Oh, okay. Look at how to find. Next slide, please. High fructose corn syrup. Absolutely good. And in any processed food, you're going to find it. So not only is it a GMO product, but the high content of sugars, it's a double whammy you want on board. Next slide, please. Oh, I should make my, my pitch about fish oils. I have the distinction. I'm known as the doctor who ruined fish oil here in Pittsburgh. I'm proud to say I am he. This thing with fish oils, uh, and I was the greatest prescriber of fish oils that there could be, but I should have figured there was something wrong when the doctor down the street, who had no knowledge in nutrition whatsoever, started to prescribe fish oil to his patients. And I said, well, how interesting is that? I think that's really good. Then I saw the orthopedic term. Then pretty soon, everybody was being put on fish oil. That's when I should have known that something was wrong. Turns out what's wrong here is we were sold a bill of goods by, of all people, the Scandinavians, who have only one natural resource. It's called fish. And they told us in the 1970s, oh, <coughs> you Americans, with that diet of yours, all those fats and those omega-6s, what you need is a good, healthy dose of omega-3s. And we've got the ideal product for you. It's called fish oil. It contains EPA and DHA. They are, they are omega-3s for sure. But these are very potent and powerful omega-3s. You, in the words of Jack Nicholson, you can't handle it. You, this is like building a house, having the foundation dug, and having a truck drop off the shingles at the job site instead of the bricks and the mortar. EPA and DHA will ultimately be formed after the building blocks are in place, but you shouldn't be trying to balance out any diet. By the way, we now know, as of 1993, that a diet, in terms of its fats, and that's the most important thing in your diet that you can eat. So of the, of the three food groups, carbohydrates, fats, and protein, it is the fats that are the most important. So if that's just sent a shiver up your spine, you're already thinking the old, I mean, there was a point where if you used the word fat, it was like you were barking at the moon, like some sort of a, uh, a figure from haunted houses. But no, you need these fats. And we know that the ratio from the work of an Israeli scientist, his name is Shlomo Yehuda, but he's Jewish, all right, okay? It is... Research of 1993 showed that we need a ratio of 4 to 1 of omega-6s to omega-3. We always needed more omega-6. And all these omegas can be obtained, 6s or 3s, can be obtained from organic plant-derived sources, so you really don't have to have them from the animal foods. Fish oil is, and I make a statement on the radio show, I've been doing it for years, Taking fish oil is hazardous to your health because when you take EPA and DHA, you upset something you don't want to mess with. And if you take, and I know people that take gobs of this fish oil, um, but you mess with the prostaglandin system, and in particular, one of the products in it called arachidonic acid, and you do not want to flip the proportionality of arachidonic acid because you will shut down your ability to inflame altogether, and you need the ability to inflame. Next slide, please. That's my, that's my pitch for fish oils. Next slide, please. <clears throat> deficiencies. This just happens to be one that Dr. Kondrak, two deficiencies that he finds are replete in the population with eye diseases. Number one, zinc in macular generation, and number two, Chromium and glaucoma. 
So during this particular time in three days, we have people on pretty high doses of that, and they're going to continue to be on them for quite some time. Next, please. Next slide. Number two, hydration. It's a medium by which things get to move around the body. You, you've got to have a way to get fluid to move nutrients into and out of the cell. Now that's blood. Yes, but the blood must be non-viscous. You've got to have good hydration. They say that you should be taking half of your body weight in ounces. If you have 140, then you need to be taking 70 ounces a day in water. And I don't have to get into too deeply into the place, the one place that that water should not come from, and that is your tap. Right? But beyond that, it's like bottled water. Uh, next slide, please. Reverse osmosis, which is a in-home. Um, next slide. There's our pretty expensive units, but uh, there are people who have whole house water with these particular kinds of units. But the hydration component can't be ignored. Next slide, please. Here's one. And there, here's one. Uh, I bet you in this group, you're able to accomplish this a little better than certainly I and maybe other things, which is getting this issue of your autonomic nervous system under control. What they believe is medically known is that all disease is usually accompanied by sympathetic overstimulation. And with that comes vasoconstriction, which limits the blood flow to the area. Well, if you have a diminished amount of blood flow to the area, you can't repair anything. You can't get nutrients in. You can't get waste products out. So there needs to be ways that you're taught to handle with this sympathetic over discharging. Next slide, please. These are the ones that I think that this your group should be pretty doggone good at. You know, exercise, meditation, prayer, positive affirmations. This is exudes to me what you all do here. Okay? But for we mortals who can't do it, and I'm not good at any of those. Okay? I'm not good at any of them. I'm going to need some help. Okay. A lot of people need some help, and we need to use microcurrent. The use of microcurrent, and there's a, one of the special ones that we're in this tent that we're going to be talking about, uh, where I'll describe it in a little more depth. Microcurrent is a way to actually take control of the situation. If you don't have the ability to shut these things down on your own, you've got to turn off the sympathetic switch. Whether you do it with your ability to control this, or with some help. Boy, this is a big player in why this three days can be so monumental in terms of the, the turnaround in your vision in three days. That microcurrent plays a big role. Next slide, please. This uh, exercise, talking about the rebounder here, a lot of people uh, think this is a great way, especially for the elderly, you can't run the marathons anymore. <clears throat> Just to jump on that little trampoline right there it seems to be a great activity for not just the elderly. It's a great activity for any of us. But exercise, and I won't go any further with it, that is absolutely a part of the 10 I essentials. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Sleep and light therapy uh, is a therapy. Um, but the use of light, in particular, what lights to avoid, which is blue light, and what light to proceed toward is ultraviolet light. Uh, we also have a, ter a therapy called syntonic light therapy, where the color, of, you wear certain glasses and stare into a light that allows certain color of the spectrum to come through. And these colors end up being able to shut down the sympathetic nervous system also. It turns out to be another really important tool in getting that blood supply. But without it, you can't win. But with it, things like the microcurrent and the syntonic light therapy, looking at the lights with the 
the blue and the green hues to them are the ones that literally shut off the sympathetic overstimulation. Next slide, please. Just keep going. Next slide. I won't get into this. Next slide. Go ahead. Next. Blue light. Not good. Next. Again. Go ahead. Next. 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 There are very vision therapies. One called palming. Go ahead. Next slide. I think that's next up. Next. Um, that turns out to have a therapeutic benefit and we instruct their patients on how to do the palming. Sunning. Next slide. Where that wouldn't work too much for me. I often joke that uh, I've never lost a pair of sunglasses in my entire lifetime. Because as I walk outside, my eyes are so sensitive to light that I'm grabbing for my sunlight. I've never lost a pair, ever. Um, turns out Dr. Kondrat would want you to just shed those sunglasses completely and get the full ultraviolet stimulation, which is beneficial. Next slide, please. Next. And next. Homeopathy, there it is, number seven. The Conrad is the world's only homeopathic ophthalmologist. Remember, it's what rescued him from his asthma, and he incorporates homeopathic remedies in what we're doing both during that three days and beyond. Next slide, please. Next. Next. That's more about homeopathy. Next. And next, next, microcurrent. Interesting set of photographs here. Um, I, I'm a golfer. I don't know if anybody's a golfer here, but we have a famous golfer since departed. His name is Sam Snead. Maybe you've heard of Sam Snead. Maybe you haven't heard of Snead. But uh, he, he was quite the golfer, quite the gentleman. And Sam Snead, as he aged, Go figure, developed eye problems. Funny how that happens. So he had macular degeneration, his vision was going down in tips. So he, uh, for some reason, had recommended to him that he should pursue microcurrent. And Dr. Ed Condra found out of Sam's interest in microcurrent. So wherever Ed was at the time, he took off to Houston, which is where Sam Snead was living, and made a deal with Sam. And the deal was that he would provide Mr. Snead with all the microcurrent treatment that he would require if Sam Snead would teach him how to play golf. That was the, that was the trade off. So I think this archive picture is going to get down. Is an amazing stuff. This is Sam Snead. So over here, getting the microcurrent, and over here, giving the golf lesson to Dr. Ed Condra. Um, after that period of time, and as it came to the end of their relationship, a funny conclusion to this story is that Ed asked Mr. Snead, well, look, you've been, you've been helping me with my golf swing. Well, can you tell me about my golf swing in terms of how I can improve? So the way that Ed tells this is that Sam looked at him in the eye and said, look, here's what I want you to do, Dr. Condra. For the next six months, I want you to just severely cut back on your golf. And at the end of that six months, I want you to give it up completely. <laughs> 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 <Don't play golf>. <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, Dr. Condra does not play golf <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, this microcurrent issue. I, I, Dr. Condra didn't invent microcurrent, but he was the first to really apply it to these conditions that we're talking about today. Microcurrent um, has the ability through very every 
body part, every area of the body, has its own frequency. And so these are dual channel devices that on the one hand, let's say the RepNet has a frequency of 18. Okay, the back me up, 18. So what you want to do is program, and that's healthy, okay? so you want to program into the microcurrent machine the ability to project a microcurrent that resonates at that frequency. <coughs> that promotes a healthy retina. They say that the, the, the pitchfork analogy really works well here. If you have a C tuning fork and you strike it, and it's vibrating at the C note, and you take another C pitchfork and you strike it, and you bring the two together, you amplify that frequency because these two are in harmony with one another. So if you want to encourage this harmony, bring light frequencies together. And one of the programs of these dual channels is to do just that. What you also have to know is every disease has its frequency also. And so what you wouldn't want to do is you don't want to project a harmonious frequency to the pathology. So if it, pathology was a C note, and you bring another C note to it, you're going to have pathology rage more. When in fact, what you want to do is bring the D pitchfork in, and then you bring those two together, and the, and the signal ends immediately. Because they are not in harmony. They won't be in sync. And so this is what microcurrent does. Uh, the, the currents are very much reduced. The, the accent is on the word micro because in the area of pain reduction, for instance, we've had tensions out for years. And people wear them to get pain relief uh, for back pain and the like. But the amperage of those is pretty high. And that will not work for the sensitive structures of the eye. But these lesser degrees of amperage, somewhere between 4 and 80 microamps, are which they, and it looks like from uh, the uh, construction of these, the lower the amperage, the more expensive the unit. It takes that much to, to bring down that amp. Okay, next slide, please. Next. Next. These, by the way, are some of the first microcurrent stimuli. They weighed 150 pounds. When they first came out back in the day, Dr. Condra bought 10 of them. And he needed a dolly to move one of them around. Now today, go ahead, next slide. Next slide. That's the size of the microcurrent device that we use today. Literally fits in the palm of your hand. The glove that you see there is a material that's impregnated with a silver component, which is a very good conductor for electricity. And so they use the glove so that they can place the glove over top of the eyes and the other behind the head. That completes the circuit so that the um, current is distributed throughout the entire body in that way. Next slide. Next. Next. Again, please. Okay. Next. Microcurrent is one of those things I said you're going to need us to help you. This is another area and some of the very therapies that we use over that three days that you can't do for yourself. You need our help. So chelation therapy is something that, by the way, that was chelation therapy that in 1995, those lay people who were talking to me and said they were getting what I thought they said was chelation. I, I didn't even understand what the heck the word was that they were trying. That's how ignorant I was. Uh, chelation is supposed to be able to dissolve plaque from the inside of blood vessels. And I said to those people, I never heard of such a thing. Well, that's why they told me, you'd be the last to know. But 
there certainly is a process to be able to remove plaque, and I've been doing it since that time. Curation therapy is also was used to remove heavy metals, and these metals need to be diagnosed and removed through things like curation therapy, whether that's IV or oral. After we find out what metals you have, the chelating agent changes based on the metal that you happen to have accumulated over time. And so it might be IV or it could be oral or combinations thereof, some even rectal. Oxidative therapies. Yesterday we started a brand new era for Pennsylvania. I'm quite proud of it because as of yesterday, the ozone therapy that we have never <clears throat> been allowed to use as doctors in Pennsylvania, that um, got lifted yesterday. And now there is one doctor in the, in, in the state of Pennsylvania that has FDA approval to use ozone, which is a major oxidative therapy, and dispense it to their patients. And that doctor is me. So I'm real, real happy that I've been given that ability to be involved in a research program through something called the American Association of Ozone Therapists, that now the FDA is permitting, not just me, many other doctors throughout the country, just so happens I'm the only one in Pennsylvania, and probably will be that way for about a year until some other doctors get on the same bandwidth. But these oxidative therapies have such a great potential to get tissue working again. I won't get into the complexities of it, but um, ozone helps in literally everything that you can imagine, and uh, certainly eye diseases. The way we've had to do oxidative therapies that was okay in Pennsylvania was to give IV hydrogen peroxide, which I've been doing for years. A second way is to do ultraviolet blood irradiation. But the third and the most potent way is to use ozone therapy, which is now something when we started yesterday and we do in steady diet up. Next slide, please. Oh, back up there. This is a typical, by the way, um, test for heavy metals. Do you test for heavy metals? Okay. So, that's the other side of the equation. Remember I said your, your deficiency states, whatever they may be, that you do not get to leave here, you know what I mean by the word leave, without having that thing weigh in. That's going to create some sort of, of medical issue for you because you didn't provide the body with what it needs for a lifetime. The other side of that equation is you, your Pittsburghers, okay? You have soaked up toxic substances in your lifetime and continue to do so. These toxic substances don't allow tissue to work optimally either. And before you leave, they're going to weigh in. So remember, we got that patient that comes to us with their eye affliction, their glaucoma or macular degeneration as they're in their 70s have all led to this. We have to remove the metal. And so this is the typical testing that gets done to find out what the metals are. I'd say the one test that you should never do, because we had some well-intended patients who consulted with their doctor and badgered them enough, because they're, they're well-read, the patient's well-read. And so they said to their doctor, look, I think I may have some heavy metal toxicity. Well, that's a little difficult concept for that doctor. I gotta tell you, they're not they're not really adept, even understanding what you mean, but once you get badgered over and over again, finally the doctor relents and he says, Okay, all right. Let's I'm gonna order the blood test to find out what metals you have, just to shut you up. And so they order the blood test. Well, I gotta tell you, it will be the last place you're ever gonna find any of those metals. So the blood test comes back, and there are no metals. And the doctor says, see, what did I tell you? No metals whatsoever. You've got to cut it out with this discussion about having your mouth. <coughs> the reason is, 
that as you get exposed to whatever metals it may be, your tissue takes it right up into the very matrix of, the of that tissue. And the one place it's not going to be is floating around in your blood. It's locked up into that tissue. That's the problem. It's locked up there. And wherever that happens to be, that tissue is not going to function correctly. And if that's the eye, certainly is going to be involved with your visual manifestations, your poor vision. But what you have to do when you want to find out if there's a heavy metal, you have to give a provocative agent first. You have to give something that you take, whether it's IV or oral, that literally is a chelating substance that pulls the metal from wherever it is from the tissue into the blood. And once in the blood, it will one, pass, one um, time pass through the kidneys, and you analyze the urine, not the blood after the provocative agent's been given. There, you will find, this is a urine test, there you will find this particular patient, this was PB, that's lead. By the way, it's pretty common to find lead really high. The four that I find over and over again are lead, mercury, especially in those of my age group because of mercury amount and fillings is the way this is conducted. A long time. I think nowadays most dentists can't even look you in the eye without owning up to the fact this is unhealthy stuff. You can't use you can't use mercury mountain fillings anymore. But we have a couple stalwart dentists that continue to try. It's the white stuff. It's the composite material that needs to be used. So lead and mercury, especially in those that have some years on them. As well as cadmium and aluminum are the, are the four, probably the four most common metals that I own. And I gotta go work on a scheme to get rid of those metals. Next slide. Next. And those are the various forms of chelation therapy that can be undertaken. Next. You got the ozone therapy. Um, that we'll be using uh, as an autohemotherapy, the main major autohemotherapy, we literally give the ozone by taking blood from you, putting it in an IV bag, mixed with saline, and then a dose of ozone that you inject in the bag that immediately reacts with the blood, immediately, and forms something called an ozonite, and we give you your blood back. Now that blood has an ingredient called an ozonite that has nothing but great things it can do to get all of your tissue, mitochondria, to function optimally. That's probably as much as you want to get into that discussion today. There's the peroxide and the ultraviolet light for the oxygen therapy. Next slide, please. Next. Next. And the tenth. Stem cells. As of right now, we, we in this particular group of uh, uh, the three-day treatment program, do not use stem cells. There's great amounts of research that are going on right now. It might be at some time in the future that we do use stem cells if they're just not being used today. And for me to ever use them, obviously they're going to have to pass a threshold of safety that Every one of these other therapies has passed, but there might be good things for that coming up in the near future. So Ed mentions it today, but um, it's just dangled out there as something in the future. Next slide, please. Look up the contract there. Next. 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 Go ahead, next. Next. Next slide. So there's this three-day program. And it involves an aggressive three days where all 10 of these things come to bear, or nine of them, come to bear on patients' medical situation that allows us to rapidly change the picture to a rosy one, that they're able to gain, 
in the initial days, I guess I've been involved with Dr. Kondrat for over six years now. He would come to Pittsburgh, he would call me when he was coming, and whether we did it in a hotel or in my office, I was he would do the evaluation of the patient, and he'd turn loose to me, and I'm doing all these therapies up. But in those first one or two programs I was involved with, I watched these people on the third day leave jumping a line or two on an eye chart. And I'm saying, hey, what, what kind of scam are you running here? Okay. I've never seen such a thing. And he said, this happens all the time. So it's six years later, or seven years later. I've come to expect what I find on day one. And I've been amazed in such a short period of time, two, three days later, how much improvement can occur in that three days. And that message that I bring to you, and I hope you can pass on to others now, is you need to and can restore your lost vision now. You can do it in conditions that the conventional medical community do not believe is possible. We can't worry about them because if that doctor who was in that talk that I gave two weeks ago is indicative of the medical community, and I believe he is, he's going to be waiting for the double blind, placebo controlled, crossover, randomized, gobbly look. And that's never going to shake out with the therapies that we're using. Because there's no money in these therapies. Okay. And they're not going to be the great studies conducted to ever get him to where he will have his beautiful studies to look at. We can't worry about him. I don't describe any negative qualities to them other than he's misguided. And uh, I'll never need those studies. Right? So wait for those studies. Um, it's unimportant to me. Everything that I've told you literally is, is considered by conventional medicine as anecdotal. That's, that's how they dismiss literally anything they want to dismiss by saying, oh, they jumped a line or two or three on your chart chart. Oh, well, that's just an anecdote. It's anecdotal. Well, if you were the person who jumped the three lines, I don't think they're going to let you get away with saying something like that. It's anecdotal. Okay. He's saying again. So if that is anecdotal, then let it come. And let it roll. And let, allow others to benefit from these therapies. If the research is ever going to catch up, uh, that'd be wonderful. But if it doesn't, we don't care. So now you're emissaries of mine. You are aware of something maybe you weren't aware of before that you're going to come into contact with people with these eye afflictions is for short. More than likely, they are going to happen in your own families, certainly in acquaintances, and that now that you're aware of it, you have a way to recommend that they proceed to get this problem taken care of and turned around. So I want to thank you for allowing me to spend this time with you. You're loaded for bear. you got all this information you can walk out of here with. I'll allow you to ask me questions if you have any at all. Please go right ahead. Uh, I, once again, I want to thank you for allowing me to spend the morning with you. We did a great radio show that you may or may not part of. I, I promised to get you a copy of the show uh, that Dr. Chaudhry and I did um, that was broadcast this morning. And uh, I've been making a copy of it and send over to you. Yes, sir. Um, three lines of improvement. <coughs> I'm 2040. Would three lines get me back to 2020? How about this? Well, uh, how about this? Okay. And by the way, three lines of improvement happens a lot okay. in three days. Is that 2020 from well, 2040? I think you're trying to do fighter power mathematics, and you got to drop back just a little bit. When you come in, if you're seeing it 2200, okay. If you jump at three lines, you're now at 2080, okay? Which is a major turnaround for you because your poor vision took you to 2200. You're being blind. So I don't see that happening in the way that you describe it. Like if you just simple math and say, oh, I jumped three lines, I could be a uh, butterfly. Well, no. 
I, I don't see that happening. You've got to have a degree of affliction and disease that's commensurate with failed vision. Um, I will have, I, I know this will sound unbelievable to you, but to me, this woman, and thank goodness I have an optometrist that every patient that I see, and I just says, the first thing that happens on Monday morning is we say, hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Cozy enough in there. Um, so they, we send them to get an assessment of the professional. I want that unbiased professional opinion for looking over my shoulder. I love it. Okay. So on day one, this woman was sent down there, and she was she had glaucoma, and her vision was completely blind. She was 22 months. She could see virtually no lines, okay. not none. Now three days later, and I'm compelled to do the testing. She starts reading these lines back to me. She jumped 10 lines. So I sent this patient off to the other doctor, the real eye doctor, say, who is equally amazed. We, to this very day, have that case in our minds as being so atypical. I've never seen, Ed Condrat had never seen somebody jump that, that level of improvement. That was 10 lines. She went to 24 when I mean, she was legally blind. Um, so, yes, I was amazed. But and she's very atypical. But this one and two and three line improvement is something we find all the time when these diseases are the cause of. And if you're seeing the, the poor vision because of a refractory problem, this condition in and of itself, at least treatment term would be helpful. But if your problem is retinal, if the problem is at the retina. This is where we do the best work. And those four diseases, three, really, because the cataract issue isn't retinal. Cataract issue is lens. So one thing about the lens, I told you there was a special program. And this has only been launched two weeks ago. And um, I've got my first <coughs> patients going through it. So cataract, they're the most common of the eye diseases. They say over the age of 60, um, 80% of people are going to have cataracts. But it's going to happen all the And what normally happens is the optometrist or ophthalmologist says to the patient, oh, I see here, look in their eye, where you have the beginnings of cataracts. Now what we're going to do is we're going to watch you and follow the progress of these things. And at some point, if this gets a little out of hand, then I'm going to send you to get the surgery, or I'm going to do the surgery, they remove the natural lens, which is cloudy and have all these toxic substances on it. And they put in an artificial lens, which um, is crystal clear. And literally, they're seeing like a people the next day. This is how good this surgery can be. So it's wonderful that we can do that for people. But I already told you that there's a percentage of folks, this is a surgery, that don't do that well at all. In fact, their vision gets worse. So we don't ever want surgery to be the only option. Surgery should always be put last. But there are no options. Because if the option is, I'm going to watch you until it gets bad enough, and then I'm going to send you for a surgery, there's nothing to do in there. Yeah. But now there is. We know that a mixture of DMSO, used by the veterinary community for years, okay? DMSO, vitamin C, and glutathione can literally dissolve these cataracts. So we started a program two weeks ago where patient establishes with me, gets evaluated by the doctor, so where the, the actual comments can be made about what the, the professional sees the lens, and then we put them on three months of these drugs. And then they got to go back, and we have to find out what kind of improvement they have in dissolving. I'm really more interested in what the patient tells me. If they tell me, man, I'm really seeing a lot better, then although I want to listen to what the optometrist said, 
I don't care what the outcome is. Isn't the idea the patient? The patient's seeing a lot better. And I don't care what the eye exam says. We're going to go with what the patient says because they're seeing better. So that's our three-month project to see if we can dissolve them with just the drug. You see, the DMSO is a patchwork. <clears throat> You first put in the mixture of glutathione and vitamin C, and then right behind it, the DMSO, which takes it through the cornea into the aqueous and vitreous humor of the eye and gives it access to the lens itself. So that DMSO penetrates these tissues and pushes in the glutathione and the vitamin C, which does all the great work. That's plan A. Three months. If we're successful, wonderful, we steep them on the drugs. If not, we have plan B. Plan B is the three-day program. And they're on another three-month flight path. By the end of six months, the story will be unfolded pretty clear. If we've been able to help them, great, and we should have been able to help quite a few, good number. And if not, that's the time that you go to the surgery. Because now you've tried everything. Surgery has been flipped to the end, and you were successful, you weren't successful. At least you were given an opportunity to try to resolve this without the surgery. And I think it's a great set of options to be able to provide some. Question, sir. A few days ago, a 70 year old friend comes to see me, tells me that he just diagnosed me with macular degeneration. Does Dr. Schauder say he's living in fear? And this three-day program, I intend to call them right after that. Oh, great. Uh, this three-day program, is it a three-day stay or could be a, a commute type of deal? Um, <coughs> we, have, we, have a, we have people come from all over the country, and we have a range with a local hotel that and had the name range for transportation. So literally, the person just has to make it to us. Sometimes they get dropped off. Uh, if they live in another part of the city, I would prefer them not traveling. So um, right now, we, we're going to my South Hills location. They stay at a hotel. They're bused in every morning. It's 9 to 5 each of the three days. So um, uh, we find that that works very well. We have, have a special nice room rate. Special room rate. Uh, and it's, we've used it a number of times. Now. So yeah, that, that first, by the way, you know what it was wet or dry, or don't you know how you want it? OK. It won't matter. But um, you'll have your own own person to watch now. Where, where they stand on the way in, where they stand on the way out. Pretty amazing. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, really does more than what we talked about today. Uh, as you can tell with each there's really not a lot of time to do it justice for that. So I'm hoping that we'll have some series of conversations over time. We're really going to get to know some of the additional uh, knowledge base and treatments that we offer. I really going to appreciate you, um, the time you brought in all this stuff. Yeah. Just this morning, we really talked about what we do here. I mean, the thing that we cannot talk a lot about here is mindfulness. Nobody kind of walks through this practice without hearing the mindfulness. They get sick and tired of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. But that's the fabric of our practice. <laughs> that really is. And but that practice alone cannot offer solutions to various other conditions. You know? As we were talking earlier, you know, we have people with severe diabetes, hypertension, you know, obesity, pain issues, there's cancer, other so many of other conditions. So we really need other professionals who know better about other disciplines. And thus the excitement of kind of collaborating, whether it's the sleep you know, center that we are collaborating with or physical therapy people that you do as a chiropractor. And this is a brand new area for us uh, to kind of explore. And then, um, Lisa, he's a soldier out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to be collecting this thing to making a smaller mini army of integrated scientists, you know, who do different things. But yet they are able to collaborate together because I would have no knowledge about how to do things. And actually, 
uh, Dr. Mark Hammond, uh, who, who himself was, I believe, a family doctor and then became very depressed, actually then found out that he had a mercury, uh, you know, uh, poisoning, basically speaking. And then he became an advocate of just trying to help people understand how we can be, you know, so much unknowingly having things in our body. And many times I get patients ask me this question, do you do these testing? I don't have a clue, so I don't want all the things that I don't know more. I don't want really to do those things. But my excitement is that we will now have someone who knows better what to order, how to make some sense out of that order, and then how to be able to help people. Because it, it's more justified to do those things. I would not be ordering MRI or a CT study. I don't, I don't know how to read them. I don't have a clue how to read those things. And I think that that's why we want to have people who know what they're doing best and then collaborate with them. I'm hoping we're still in early phase of having Dr. Cartman actually come here <coughs> and consult on the site. That would be very exciting. Then we'll do a Zumba dance with him. <laughs> <laughs> you have any business cards, Dr. Courtney? Courtney, do you have any business cards with you? Absolutely. I have a whole bunch of them and I brought them over here, so please tell them that there's already one in the book that we gave you. If not, we will bring them over here. Please take them. I'll leave them uh, all for you here. I think all the cards in the book are on the You know what? I think I'll be a lot of them.